Hello, my name is Carrie Allen, and I'm happy to talk with you today about psychotropic medications and some side effects that caregivers should know about. I'm a pharmacist, and I specialize in geriatrics, pharmacotherapy, and psychiatric pharmacy. The first thing to go over is what is a psychotropic medication? You may have heard them called psychoactive medications or psychopharmacological medications, but basically all this means is that these are medications that have an effect on the mind. So perhaps the emotions, depression, or behaviors if someone's acting out. Before we get started, just a little bit about medications and older adults from the National Institute of Mental Health. These are pretty generic tips, but since we're talking about psychoactive medications today, I thought we would do a little nod to NIM and their thoughts on older adults. This is available on their website. Older adults should be careful when they're taking any medications, especially when they're taking many different drugs. And we're aware as caregivers that older adults tend to take a lot of medications. They have a higher risk for drug interactions because of all those medications, but also a higher general risk of unwanted side effects, missing doses, maybe because they have too many medications or a memory problem, or overdosing on the medications that they are taking. And it's not because they are necessarily taking a lot of one medication, although that could be the case, but it's because they tend to be more sensitive to medications and they react to medications differently than younger people because their bodies process and eliminate the medications more slowly. Even if you're a healthy older person, that can be true. Let's dive right into the primary classes of psychotropic medications. Now, many medications, even blood pressure medications, can have an effect on the mind. But what we're focusing on here are medications that are classified by their action in a really typical way that we think of acting on the mind. So medications that affect people in terms of anxiety, we call them anxiolytics sometimes, antidepressants to help elevate the mood, antipsychotics, which are sometimes called neuroleptics, we'll get into those in some detail, mood stabilizers, sometimes those are called anti-mania, anti-manics, sedative hypnotics, which is kind of our fancy pharmacist term for a sleep aid, and stimulants. Common anti-anxiety agents or anxiolytics are on the screen here, and I won't go through all of them, but you might notice that they end in the same few letters and the words in parentheses. So your PAMs and your LAMs. I think most people are familiar with Valium, which is diazepam, or maybe Xanax, which is alprazolam. These medications have side effects that go sort of hand in hand with helping with anxiety. They might make people feel sleepy or drowsy for a prolonged period of time, even dizzy. They also have what I like to call Benadryl type effects. They're anticholinergic effects, meaning that they give you this dry mouth feeling, sometimes blurred vision, confusion, you're not thinking as clearly as you might normally do. And sometimes they have the effect of disinhibition, which basically means that people will act out in a way that they're not normally going to do. Sometimes people act as though they might be a little bit drunk. They might take off their clothes. They might be unsteady in their walking and do things that are uncharacteristic. If taken for a long period of time, these medications, especially benzodiazepines, the PAMs and LAMs on your screen here, are associated with depression. They can also cause incontinence and or holding in urine and or constipation. And what do I mean by that? That sounds like a lot of stuff that's almost contradictory. Well, incontinence certainly could be caused by the fact that you're too sleepy or drowsy to recognize that you have to go to the bathroom. And, and so you might urinate in bed or in a chair if you're taking these kind of medications. It could also be that it's slowing your ability to get to the bathroom in time. Sometimes we call that a functional incontinence and someone might have urinary incontinence for that reason. But also because of those drying kind of Benadryl-like effects, what will happen is sometimes the body won't release all the urine when you go to the bathroom. And when that happens, over time it builds up and we have what we call overflow incontinence. I mentioned, of course, these can cause difficulty in walking. Now, when there's difficulty in walking, especially when you're older, you know what happens. Sometimes people break bones, large bones in their leg, their arm, their shoulder, especially their hip. In many older people, this can be so detrimental that it leads to death very close thereafter. So we want to be very careful with these medications. Antidepressants seem sort of harmless, but 
in a way, they're almost insidiously dangerous, and it sort of depends on the class. I have a lot of different medications listed here, and there are a ton more of antidepressants out there, and you can look on the National Institutes of Medicine website or the FDA website for a list for more of these. But I have a few up here I'd like to point out. So for example, going down the list just before the orangey yellow, we've got Remeron. Now Remeron is one of those medications that people tend to feel is benign. We like to give it to people who have depression and maybe are also having trouble sleeping because it's sedating and maybe also have appetite problems because it can increase your appetite. Unfortunately, this can lead to some other side effects that we'll get to on the other side of the screen. Before I get there, though, the two items in orangey-yellow, Elevil and Pamelor, which are amitriptyline and nortriptyline, these are medications that are older. They're known as tricyclic antidepressants, and they have a lot higher risk of all those side effects that are listed here on the slide, as well as toxicities. You might see these given to people who have depression and or neuropathic pain. They have that nerve pain that maybe comes with diabetes or other conditions. The side effects of antidepressant medications very commonly when you first start is stomach upset and that's because you don't just have receptors in your brain. They eventually get to your brain to work but the majority of receptors that you have that these act on are actually in your stomach at first and you usually build up tolerance. If you don't build up tolerance or something happens along the way this could be a sign of toxicity. They can make people sleepy. They can also make people very activated. It depends on the antidepressant. Dizziness is common, blurred vision, confusion, increased heart rate, especially with the medication called Effexor or Venlafaxine listed on your screen. Weight changes that I mentioned with Remeron, but also in the opposite direction. You might lose weight if someone is taking fluoxetine, for example. Seizures, suicidal thoughts, is also a point to bring up. There's a boxed warning on all antidepressant medications, and this is the highest, strongest caution that the FDA gives, saying that these medications can actually increase the risk of suicidal thoughts or actions. Now, this is technically just in younger people, not listed so much in older adults, but what we do know is that older adults have a higher risk for suicide overall, and the reporting mechanisms we have for older adults might not always be catching this type of action. So I'd watch out. If you are caregiving someone who's newly started, especially, or increased dose on an antidepressant agent, watch out for anything that might be triggering thoughts of self-harm or anything you recognize as suicidal thoughts. And again, you can get that incontinence or constipation going on. Before we get into antipsychotics, which are a big topic nowadays, and you know people who are older, that's kind of an initiative if you aren't familiar to get people off of antipsychotics if we can. Let's talk a little bit about psychosis and what that really means. So psychosis is not really a mental disorder in and of itself. It's a symptom where a person becomes sort of out of touch with their reality and their environment. They might have hallucinations. They may not recognize stimuli the way that you and I would recognize it. Now, psychosis could be caused by a physical illness. Think of a very high fever, for example, or maybe it happens after someone has abused a substance or they're in withdrawal. Sometimes it happens as the result of extreme trauma or stress, and we all know that older people don't respond to trauma or stress in the same way that they did when they were younger. So they're predisposed to have some sort of psychosis, especially if there's medications like anesthesia post-surgery. Now, some mental illnesses cause psychosis. I think we're all familiar with schizophrenia as causing psychosis. However, always, always question the diagnosis of a psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia when it starts late in life, especially in these older people. And if you've got an older person who has a late in life diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia and they're prescribed an antipsychotic, make sure it's prescribed by a competent professional in mental health and that perhaps you get a second opinion because late life schizophrenia is not terribly common. Common antipsychotic agents are listed there on your screen and you've probably heard of Haldol, that's an old one. You might have heard of Abilify. They market that on television as an adjunct sometimes to help people who have depression if your antidepressant isn't working that well. But it's really an antipsychotic and therefore it has side effects typical of antipsychotics, which 
can make you sleepy or drowsy. They can make you dizzy and they can make your blood pressure drop when you're changing positions, going from seated to standing or maybe getting up out of bed. Some people call that orthostatic hypotension. And when you have that, you are at high risk for falls. And we saw earlier in the presentation that that can lead to harm and death, especially in older people. Blurred vision and dry mouth are common. Difficulty thinking clearly, even though these medications are meant to address some sort of psychosis, it doesn't mean that it's helping people think clearly. I want to especially point out people with dementia who are taking antipsychotics or people with Parkinson's disease who are taking antipsychotics. This can go against the medications that we're using to help them with their dementia and with their Parkinson's. Weight changes and fluid retention and swelling can be common. They can cause high blood pressure or seizures. And again, the problems with incontinence and or constipation. Now those are some common side effects. Now here are some even worse side effects. And as I go down the pathway here, these are sort of related to one another for the first four bullets or three bullets. So tremors, start just in the hands, maybe a little bit when someone's reaching for something or sitting. And then people will progress to having trouble moving their limbs or walking. They might shuffle. And it looks a little bit like Parkinson's disease. Sometimes we call it pseudo-Parkinsonism, or in the case where it's being caused by an antipsychotic, we call it drug-induced Parkinsonism. And this is where you really have to start to watch out. We can stop it, we can reverse it, if we're here, if we let it go and we don't stop the antipsychotics, we don't get help from a medical professional, we can move on to tardive dyskinesia. And this is a permanent alteration in the ability to move. The other thing that antipsychotics do is that they increase the risk of death from all causes in elderly persons with dementia, but especially things like stroke. There's some older data about this and they're coming up with new data all the time that support it. A little bit more about these antipsychotic side effects. Tardive dyskinesia, just so you're aware of what it is, it's this permanent involuntary movement of the tongue, the mouth, the face, the trunk. You might see people moving very oddly. If you Google this and you look on YouTube, you'll see lots of great examples. Their arms and legs will move uncomfortably like Parkinson's disease, but involuntarily. And it happens with the older or typical antipsychotics as well as the newer or atypical antipsychotics. Antipsychotics can also cause metabolic syndromes, so excess weight gain, increased blood pressure, high blood sugar, and cholesterol. One final thing, and this is very rare, but you should be aware of it, is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's a medical emergency. It's extreme muscle stiffness, a very high fever, sweating, heart rate's going very fast, unstable blood pressure, lots of confusion, you wanna call emergency services as soon as possible if you recognize something like this happening. And as always, I don't want you to forget that antipsychotics unequivocally can cause death in older people with dementia. Now, I followed antipsychotics with mood stabilizers for a couple reasons. Mood stabilizers, sometimes called anti-manic agents, are given to people in many cases in conjunction with antipsychotics or since antipsychotics have kind of gotten this bad name in older people, the, these medications are being prescribed more and more often instead of antipsychotics in the thought that they might be safer. They still have side effects though and how efficacious they are, how well they work is not necessarily well known. So mood stabilizers, you might notice on this list here, some of these are actually anti-seizure medications. And that's because we found not only do they stabilize the neurons in the brain for seizures, they also sort of control mood. So Depakote is one you might have heard of, or Depakine, Tegretol, and then Lithium. Lithium is not an anti-seizure medication. It's more commonly known as an anti-manic medication. The side effects of these are dizziness, drowsiness, blurred vision, nausea and vomiting. And now you can get nausea and vomiting with almost any medication, but in these, sometimes it can be quite pronounced. Constipation, electrolyte imbalances, particularly with lithium. You can get serious rashes with any of these, but especially with Tegretol. 
and blood disorders. So maybe your white blood cells, the things that fight off infection, won't work as well. Their count will go down, so you have to monitor for that. Liver problems, so what you're looking for there is yellowing of the eyes or the skin. Brief note about lithium. This is a tricky, tricky drug. It's really actually a salt, and it works in your body just like any other salt would. So you can get toxic pretty quick on it if you're not monitored. So if you notice that someone's taking lithium and they have repeated vomiting and diarrhea, severe tremors, they can't walk, they have poor coordination, they're very sleepy and slurred and muscles are twitching, they might even progress to seizures, that's a sign of lithium toxicity. And dehydration can predispose someone to lithium toxicity. So if you live in a warm climate or it's summertime, that's something to look for most especially. Moving on to sedative hypnotic agents, again, that's my fancy pharmacist term for our sleep aids. I've listed a few here, but of course there are many more. We've got Ambien, which is Zolpidem, and at the bottom of the list I have Restoril, which is Temazepam. You may notice the PAM that actually falls similarly in the class of the anti-anxiety medications, the benzodiazepines that I mentioned earlier. So it'll have the same sort of side effects. The interesting thing about Ambien and some of the other medications like this is that they have both age and gender restrictions. And it's because of the way the drug distributes in the body. If the drug distributes in the body all over the place, it's unpredictable as to how long it'll last or what kind of side effects it'll have. So Ambien for older people and or women has a maximum dose threshold specific to the fact that it goes all over the place in the body. The side effects that you're probably aware of when anyone takes a sleep aid are dizziness and daytime drowsiness, that kind of hangover effect. But also in coordination, this is why they say don't operate heavy machinery. The impaired ability to think, so you're not thinking clearly, you're slower in your thinking. And again, with people with dementia, we, we don't want that. The incontinence and constipation issues come up. There can be extreme lethargy and blurred vision, which of course can lead to falls. I think we've all heard stories, especially with Ambien, but it happens with other medications that are sedative hypnotics as well, of unusual behaviors. And people might get up and make a sandwich or cook or drive or order stuff online that they wouldn't normally do, and they don't remember doing it. So these have an amnestic or an amnesia type effect. Sometimes also there's hallucinations, and it's because these medications, especially if you don't take them and immediately go to bed, if you have a lag time before you're laying in bed, can lead to these hallucinations because there's sort of a break between your sleep reality and your wake reality. Now, our final set of medications are known as stimulants. And you might not think of stimulants, especially if you're looking at the medications on the screen, Adderall, Ritalin, you, you might not think of these being used in older people. These are ADHD medicines that we use for young adults and teenagers and children who have ADHD, the attention deficit disorder. There's also pro-vigil and new vigil, which are more commonly known with narcolepsy. What happens commonly is you get someone who is, let's say, taking a sedative hypnotic or taking an anti-anxiety medication, and they get that hangover effect. They get the sleepiness. They get the drowsiness. They're not cognitively awake enough to visit. So what happens is what we in the pharmacy world call a prescribing cascade, meaning that you're prescribing a medication to treat the side effect of another medication. Maybe we should have done something about the first medication rather than bring on a second medication that has a whole bunch of side effects. So some of the side effects associated with stimulants are trouble sleeping, as you might imagine, dry mouth, increased blood pressure, decreased appetite and weight loss. We've got headaches, stomach aches, jitteriness, social withdrawal, and sometimes people have tics. They make involuntary sounds. They grind their teeth. They do things that aren't typical of them. It may even go so far as to become aggressive behavior or hostility. Remember, these are psychoactive medications. They're acting on the brain. We don't always know what they're going to do in the brain. Some people even go to psychotic or manic symptoms. And this is where I want to engage that phrase prescribing cascade again. So what happens when people get down to the aggressive behavior or the psychotic behavior? Sometimes people don't stop and think it could be because of the stimulant that they're on. And then we put them on you guessed it, an antipsychotic 
or a mood stabilizer or both. So the concept of these side effects that I've gone through in this presentation can certainly stand alone for each class of medications. But as a caregiver or even as a patient, I think it's really important to think of them as a whole. If someone's having a side effect, are we getting to the root of the cause? Are we decreasing the dose of the medication? Are we weaning someone off of an anti-anxiety medication or a sedative hypnotic rather than adding a stimulant or an antipsychotic? So thinking of people holistically in the whole picture is important. And thinking about side effects and what can happen if someone doesn't examine the root cause is important. On the screen here, I just have some resources for caregivers. The National Institute on Aging has a caregiver website that's listed there, as well as the National Institute on Mental Health. They have an older adults and mental health webpage. Here at MMLearn, we also have many resources for caregivers for medications and non-medication topics as well. I want to thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you've learned a lot.